Some events in history seem overdetermined. Scientific discoveries are often made by multiple people independently around the same time. Some victories aren't decided by a single battle, or the victors of many wars often seem assured beforehand. But there are other historic events that could have gone very differently. Moments that we look back on and it seems to us that the future was in that moment hanging in the balance. The story of this or that nation or the whole world could have looked very different if, say, that person had been killed or if patient zero had stayed home that day, if that battle had not been won. A very prominent British-Australian historian of Alexander the Great and this period that we've been looking at, Brian Bosworth, he remarked that the conflict between Eumenes and Antigonus the One-Eyed, as he puts it, probably did more than anything to define the shape of the Hellenistic world. By Hellenistic world, Bosworth means the Eastern Mediterranean and the Middle East in the period from the death of Alexander in 323 BC until 31 BC. And that second date, 31 BC, was when the Battle of Actium took place. And that's an event that sealed Rome's control over Egypt as well as most of the rest of these territories. The Hellenistic world is, in short, the world in which Persia, Syria, Egypt, Asia Minor were all ruled by Greeks. Hellenic and Hellenistic are terms derived from the Greek word for Greek. And in this scheme, the Macedonians count as Greeks, which is true in a general sense, and their cities were populated by a lot of regular Greeks. And the Hellenistic world was the world that gave you the library of Alexandria, Stoicism, Epicureanism, Cynicism, Skepticism, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the Septuagint that is, which paved the way for Christianity. Arguably the New Testament is a product of the Hellenistic world too, even though those lands were at the time ruled by the Romans, the fact that it was written in Greek famously as a product of Hellenistic culture. St. Paul was from Cilicia, a place that appeared a lot in the last episode. The descendants of one of the assassins of Perdiccas, Seleucus that is, his descendants ruled Judea for a long time and many other territories. It was called the Seleucid Empire, and so on and so on. And there's a great podcast I like on the Hellenistic Age. It's called just that, the Hellenistic Age, if you want to go deeper on that subject. And so, Besides Alexander's conquest, more than any other single event or process, so a renowned historian, Brian Bosworth, thinks it was what happened in this episode in particular, the conflict between Eumenes and Antigonus, that defined the shape of that Hellenistic world. I'm Alex Petkus, and you are listening to The Cost of Glory, where it is our mission to retell the most influential biographies in history, those of Greek and Roman heroes, in order to sharpen ourselves for the present. We use Plutarch as our guide. This is part three of three of the life of Eumenes of Cardia, the former secretary of Alexander the Great. And we have another guest narrator to read a couple of passages for this week's episode. Her name is Dawn Laval Norman. She's a scholar and researcher at Australian Catholic University in Melbourne. Dawn is a specialist in Roman imperial era Greek literature, and that is the era of Plutarch, of course, and in particular, early Christian writings of this period. She's got a book on Methodius of Olympus, who was a sort of imitator of Plutarch a century or two later. Dawn is a good friend, and we've co-edited a book on Hypatia of Alexandria together. You can find out more about her in the show notes. When we last left Eumenes, he had, beyond all expectation, proven himself to be a formidable general. He had just won one of the great upset victories of ancient history, the Battle of the Hellespont, in which he defeated the Macedonian commanders Craterus and Neoptolemus. But his chief commander in the war, Perdiccas, who had been appointed by common agreement at Babylon to be the protector of the kings Alexander IV and Aridaeus, or Philip III, the legitimate regent, Perdiccas, was assassinated in Egypt by his own officers. Eumenes had been condemned to death in absentia by common acclamation of the soldiers in Egypt. He had gone from the most ardent defender of the king's legitimate line to traitor and enemy of the state. Antigonus the One-Eyed was charged with eliminating him from Asia. They really called him that, by the way. Antigonus Monophthalmos in Greek. Antigonus the One-Eyed. 
It was now 3.20. How different Eumenes' life had become and how different had the world become compared to how things used to be when he would give daily reports on rations and troop registers to Alexander, discuss the royal correspondence with him, write down his daily deeds in the Persian royal diary. And all that was just some four years earlier, before it all started to unravel, before he became a leader of men. With Antigonus bearing down on him, Eumenes knew that he had to take further steps to secure the loyalty of the army. Perdiccas' assassination proved how easy it was for an entire army, officers and all, to go over to the other side, if they had reason to. And now a large portion of Eumenes' army were mercenaries, men who would fight for the man who paid them the most, and the most reliably. But of course he had to pay the entire army well, and promptly, if he was going to secure any fraction of them. So he found some clever ways to raise funds. But he also had many Macedonian troops, and these men were a little more traditional. They didn't want to be fighting for a dead man walking who was an enemy of the state, even if they were getting paid. So he had to convince them he was the legitimate representative of the king still, and he took various steps. Now on the one hand, it helped that the Egyptian army, in their haste and arrogance, had also given him a nice gift by condemning along with you many some 50 of his officers, many of them good old Macedonians. This instantly secured him against his most serious threat. If he fell, they would fall, so he could count on them more. But he proved his legitimacy with methods that showed his characteristic political savvy. For example, when he commandeered horses from a royal stables near Troy, Troy had been famous for its horses since Homer's days, well, he wrote them a careful inventory and submitted it to the royal archives, just like you do if you're a governor and not a rebel. And when Antipater got word about this, he caught the implication too. He laughed and he said, well, I guess Eumenes is going to want to see my expense report soon too. But Eumenes' strategies worked. His troops soon discovered letters circulating in the camp from Antigonus, letters promising huge sums of money to anyone who would assassinate Eumenes, three tons of silver. And Eumenes' Macedonian troops were furious, and they insisted that a thousand of the leading soldiers should become his permanent bodyguard, watching over him 24-7. Eumenes graciously accepted, and he rewarded these guys with special purple uniforms. And this was an outfit reserved as an honor bestowed by the authority of the king in Macedonian tradition. So these men became a sort of royal bodyguard in their own eyes. And Eumenes could constantly remind them that as a Greek from Cardia, he had no claim on the Macedonian throne. Suspicions that he was grasping at the supreme power rolled off him like marbles. Now Eumenes wasn't the only commander left on the Perdican side. Perdiccas' brother, Alcides, had a large army in the south of Asia Minor. Eumenes made his way to Kalinae in central Phrygia, which is a populous city, a place where Cyrus the Great had built a large palace and a hunting ground. And for the last ten years, that palace had actually been Antigonus' seat of government. And he invites Alcides and a couple of his subordinate commanders to come and visit his winter quarters there for a parley. And they try to agree on a strategy going forward. Eumenes proposes they unite their forces, hold strong, but also try to see if they can negotiate an armistice with Antigonus and Antipater. Maybe they can continue to serve the kings as governors of their original satrapies. But to get in that kind of negotiating position, they're probably going to need to win at least one battle. It's not going to be easy. Antigonus is now the most dangerous man alive. Eumenes knows him well. He knows he's good. Alcides likes the idea of a united army, but the centerpiece of his plans is himself. He wants to be the supreme commander. Come on, Eumenes, do you really think the Macedonians will follow you? I'm Perdiccas' brother, after all. And this was not exactly a point in Alcides' favor, in the eyes of Eumenes. Regency, a protectorship, unlike kingship, does not naturally devolve on brothers as though they were heirs. Eumenes did not suddenly owe the same duties to Alcides as he did to Perdiccas. And this was a request coming from the man who had only recently been his subordinate and had refused to fight Craterus with him. Hadn't Eumenes proven himself enough in the last year that he shouldn't have to deal with yet another attempted power grab by some arrogant Macedonian nobleman? Alcides was the one who actually carried out the murder of Kenane, who is now the late mother-in-law of King Philip Aridaeus, and some people even thought he did it without Perdiccas' permission. 
So at the end of the day, you many's had to weigh which was the greater risk to go at it alone, work as two divided and independent but allied armies, or commit his loyal men to the care of Alcides and entrust that man with all responsibility, both military and diplomatic, against Antigonus. Eumenes decided to choose the path in which he and his men were more masters of their own destiny, and he let Alcides and the other generals go their separate way. By the time the snow melted, Antigonus was on the scene. And so shortly after he left his winter quarters that spring, Eumenes met Antigonus on the field in the plains of Cappadocia. Antigonus brought with him 30 battle elephants, along with his 10,000 infantry. Eumenes outnumbered him in infantry, actually, and he was strong in cavalry. But unfortunately, one of Eumenes' chief cavalry commanders had been approached secretly by Antigonus beforehand. During the battle, this commander, with his entire division, switched sides in the middle of combat. So Eumenes was defeated, and he sounded a general retreat. But somehow in the chaos of it all, some of his loyal knights apprehended the traitor himself, this cavalry commander, and they hung him. So there was some justice for Eumenes' slain soldiers, but he was still defeated, and he had to sound a quick retreat. And Plutarch relates a development of this story that illustrates an important point. As he remarks, Success makes even men of smaller character look impressive to us as they stare down upon us from the heights. But it is when misfortune strikes that the truly great and steadfast man becomes unmistakable. Because after this demoralizing battle, Eumenes' forces take a circuitous route as they retreat, and they actually elude their pursuers long enough to double back and march right past them in the next valley over without being caught. And they make it back to the battlefield unhindered. Eumenes confiscates the doors from a few of the surrounding villages for firewood. He collects his dead from the battle, and he and his men build proper funeral pyres for their lost comrades. They even take the time to cremate the leaders separately from the common soldiers, like you're supposed to do. And then they bury the ashes in a great mound of earth, and they were finished and gone before Antigonus reached the site. Even Antigonus, when he came upon the scene later, was amazed at the boldness and constancy of the man. And this was the right thing to do to honor the dead, but it's impossible to overstate the psychological effect this kind of gesture has on everyone in the army, from the rank and file troops to the top brass. They really notice and they really care. It might be you next time. You have to honor your fallen. But all the same, Antigonus was still hot on the trail. Eumenes was in no position to fight. He was making his way east, trying to join up with allies further afield and salvage the situation. But the retreat was exhausting. Men were starting to desert, and he was running low on supplies. So he made an executive decision. His army was too small to fight with, and too large to hide with. Maybe he wanted to spare most of them his own likely fate, and he decides to persuade the majority of his army to leave him and whittles down his followers to a core of about 600 of his best and most loyal men. And they manage to escape to a hilltop stronghold deep in the snowy mountains of Cappadocia in the Taurus Range, a place called Nora. It's a tiny fortress, some 1,200 feet, say 365 meters in circumference, perched on a crag. That's about two acres, about the size of a pro soccer field. And they take their horses with them in there too. And they're all bottled up and secure by the time Antigonus arrives. Antigonus surrounds the fort, but before he begins his siege, he calls up to Eumenes and that booming town crier voice of his invites him out to negotiate. Come on, Eumenes, we're old friends. We used to share wine and conversation at Alexander's table. I knew you when you were a boy in Philip's retinue. This has all gotten so out of hand. We're gentlemen. We can work this out. Eumenes agrees, on condition that Antigonus send his own nephew into the fortress, along with a few other hostages. And he comes out, and they embrace one another like the friends that they had been. And they meet for a parley in Antigonus's camp. Antigonus' officers are standing all around them, watching, listening. Antigonus pleads with him. He wants Eumenes to give up hostilities, join his side, submit to Antipater, the new supreme regent in Macedonia. Now, what's going on in Eumenes' mind? 
It was true that, except for Perdiccas' brother, that last holdout toward the south, this man standing before him represented the new political and military reality controlling the throne and the kings. But should he trust this guy? Was this man serving the greater good? Hadn't Antigonus blown him off when Eumenes needed his help the most, when it was his duty to help Eumenes in securing Cappadocia before all this warring started? And isn't this the guy that convinced Antipater and Craterus to march on Perdiccas? And Eumenes suspected he had been conspiring with Ptolemy well before that, too. What was Antigonus really after? Eumenes says, Very well, my friend. We can make peace. But I'd like to continue serving the kings as the lawful governor of Cappadocia. Antigonus laughs, and he had a laugh that could knock you over, a power laugh. He says, Well, Eumenes, be reasonable. We already have a satrap of Cappadocia and it's not you. But Eumenes insists, demands even, and Antigonus starts to lose patience, and he says, My friend, considering the circumstances, shouldn't you be addressing me as your superior? And Eumenes tells him, Well, as long as I am the master of my sword, I don't consider any man my superior. And there was a stunned silence. And Plutarch says the bystanders were struck at how effortless he made his boldness look. He was speaking to the general of the royal armies. He's a younger man. He's maybe 40. Antigonus around 60. Eumenes surrounded by hostile spears. On top of that, Antigonus was master of all Phrygia and now Cappadocia, collecting the tax revenues, paying his troops richly. Eumenes has 600 tough guys crammed in a box on a hilltop and nothing else. And at a moment like this, you get a sense, looking at Eumenes, that it's not just loyalty to the royal house that is driving him. He has found within himself a core of strength and resolution that transcends any reasonable consideration of personal interest or even duty. He simply will not quit, and he has totally mastered his fear. Now, as they are still in their negotiations, Antigonus pleading with Eumenes to consider other possibilities, recall again that they are in Antigonus's camp, surrounded by officers, before they finish their conversation, Antigonus's Macedonian common soldiers start to crowd in, trying to get a look at this guy. They're trying to see what sort of man had taken down the great Craterus, because ever since that battle, this Greek was the most talked about man in the army. Antigonus starts yelling at them, hey, back off, hey. He starts picking up rocks and throwing them at the soldiers, but they just keep pressing in. Things start to get scary. A lot of these guys really loved Craterus. And as things get a little chaotic, Antigonus finally throws his arms around Eumenes, and he shouts to his bodyguards to get close, and they, they keep their heads down, and they force their way out of the crowd. When they get clear, he tells Eumenes, I'm going to have to refer your request to Antipater. And he sends him back into the fort. And immediately, he builds a double wall and a palisade around Nora. Antigonus heads off to take on Alcides and the other allies in the south. Within a few weeks, Antigonus's sieging force at Nora calls up to the men in the fort with excellent news. Alcides has been defeated and executed. Antigonus reigns supreme, unchallenged in all Asia. So much for Perdiccas's brother. And the men stuffed into Nora stared down from the ramparts at the palisade spikes pointed up at them, and things looked pretty bad. But Eumenes refused to quit. Now up in that fort they had plenty of water and salt and lots of grain, but that was about it. Those expensive war horses were probably starting to look tastier every day, and Eumenes faced a considerable leadership challenge just keeping everybody's spirits up. And here's what Plutarch says. Nevertheless, with the meager resources that he had, he managed to make his companion's life cheerful inviting everyone by turns to his own table and seasoning their common meal with the charm of his conversation. For he was not like some old veteran, worn down by a life under arms, but was attractive in appearance, refined and youthful. His whole body, with its remarkably well-proportioned limbs, resembled a carefully composed work of art. He was not an accomplished orator, but agreeable and persuasive, as can be deduced from his letters." And sadly, none of those letters survive. Now, the worst thing about this was the confinement. And now most of us can relate to this, right? 
They're all squeezed into this tiny space. They're lodging in densely packed little huts. The poor horses are just standing there soiling themselves. Everyone's just turning into jelly and they're all going a little nuts, sitting there, eating, waiting. And who knew how long they'd have to wait? So Eumenes picks out the biggest house. It's about 20 feet long. And he makes it the jogging house. And they all start to take turns doing these micro laps. The horses, though, are a little trickier. He takes some big straps, tosses them up over the rafters in one house, and he ties them around the horse's necks at the base, at the meaty part. And then he winches them up until their front legs are just a few inches in the air, the back feet still on the ground. And the horses would start trying to paw with their front hooves to get back on the ground. They'd get in this furious state. And then he has the horse grooms get up in their faces and taunt them, shout at them, crack them with the whip, just enraging these animals. And they buck around on their hind legs. They try to clobber those guys with their front legs, tossing their heads around wildly, sweating profusely. And so they get a full body workout. And then after they'd get let back down on the ground and calm down, they got some nice boiled barley. And afterwards, they seemed on balance like they were doing much better than before. And how do we know all this? Because the same guy who was at the battle with Craterus, Hieronymus of Cardia, who was actually Eumenes' countryman, later became a great historian, he was one of those 600 men. And the men end up spending the whole winter there in the fortress. And what were they waiting for? What does any city under siege hope for? Well, as with Sertorius in Spain, maybe Eumenes was just waiting for something to change out there and give him another opportunity, maybe just a better bargaining position. And in the spring, things did indeed change. Old man Antipater, the regent, Eumenes' nemesis, Antigonus' boss, dies in Macedonia. And in a surprising move, Antipater, on his deathbed, designates as successor to his office not his ambitious oldest son, Cassander, but an old comrade of his, a major battalion commander under Alexander, a guy named Polyperchon. Polyperchon was Craterus' favorite lieutenant, a soldier's soldier, sort of like a Craterus Jr., you might say. But actually, he was a lot older than Craterus, almost as old as Antipater. Dependable old Polyperchon. Yep, he's the man for the job. The new regent of the entire Macedonian kingdom, the protector of the kings. Well, it was an odd move, but at least Polyper Khan and Eumenes got along all right. Polyper Khan sort of got along with Olympias, too, within limits. Now, why did Antipater not pick his son Cassander? Did he think that rulership was just too dirty a business? He didn't want Cassander involved for his own good? Did he think Cassander didn't have the experience? Or did he perhaps recognize that Cassander was dangerous and posed an existential threat to the stability of the kingdom? Well, no comment from Antipater has come down to us, but Cassander was livid. But that was the new arrangement. Now, in fact, Antipater had made it clear to Polyperchon that even though Antigonus the One-Eyed was theoretically a subordinate, it would be safer to just let him do as he wished and be de facto lord commander of all the Asian provinces. And Egypt was still held quite securely by Ptolemy. All of this land was nominally the royal domain of the kings Alexander IV and Philip III, but the kingdom was in reality divided into three spheres of influence, with Macedonia administered by Polyperchon, Asia by Antigonus, and the various regional satraps subordinate to them, respectively, and then Ptolemy, all alone in Egypt, just like he wanted it. With Antipater dead and Polyperchon, a frankly weak replacement holding sway in Macedonia, Antigonus was the most powerful man standing. As long as he didn't mess with Ptolemy, he could rule all Asia, and if he played his cards well, probably soon Macedonia too. He felt grand, confident, and he decided to let Eumenes come out of his little ice box and give him his province of Cappadocia back. He wanted to consolidate his control over Anatolia, Asia Minor that is. Antigonus had always seen Asia Minor as the cornerstone of the empire. All roads between Macedonia and the rest of the empire led through it. And if you could control the west coast of it, you can control the Aegean, the shipping lanes. The royal roads built by King Cyrus and Darius from Persia to Greece all ran through it. Antigonus started filling other satrapies with his chosen men, and he was happy to have someone like Eumenes in place. Eumenes would then owe him a favor. 
He sends an emissary to Nora to bury the hatchet. He also sends along a written oath that Eumenes is supposed to swear. He's supposed to swear loyalty to Antigonus as commander of the royal armies. And the oath mentioned the kings too for the sake of appearances, but it mostly talked about Antigonus. Eumenes was supposed to swear it in front of an assembly of the sieging Macedonian troops. And he gets the oath, he looks at it, and he has some reservations about unqualifiedly swearing fealty to Antigonus. Oaths are very powerful, and the gods hate oath breakers, especially Zeus. And soldiers don't like fighting for people the gods hate. So perhaps he thought back to his document drafting days under Philip. Or perhaps he thought to himself, what would Odysseus do? And so he takes the oath, he rewrites it with a little correction, so that the oath will read, I swear loyalty to Antigonus and Olympias and the kings. And he hands back both oaths and asks the soldiers, which of these versions looks right to you? And they say, oh yeah, that makes sense. I'm sure that's what Antigonus meant anyway. Let's do your version. So he swears his version and they let him and his men go. And when Antigonus heard about that little alteration, he was furious because he saw what these two little words and Olympias left the door open to. But it was too late to do anything about it. Eumenes was a free man. Now the empire might have remained in that tense state of unity and peace indefinitely. The scores had been settled from the war with Perdiccas, Antigonus in Asia theoretically subordinate to Polyprochon, but really Polyprochon minding his own business in Europe. And Eumenes is now rebuilding his authority in Cappadocia. His friends and soldiers are starting to return from hiding. The other major satraps like Ptolemy and Seleucus, they're keeping quiet. There was a lot of suspicion and distrust, but things were stable. But then young Cassander, Antipater's jilted son, he became, you might say, the puff of wind that toppled the whole house of cards. Cassander was around the same age as Alexander, and they had known each other as young men. They were on decent terms. But Cassander had been held back in Macedonia to help Antipater manage the throne in Alexander's absence, while all the other noble Macedonian youth went on to share in the glory of the conquests. Cassander did visit Babylon, finally, shortly before Alexander died, but then he kind of behaved rudely to his Persian hosts, and Alexander had put him in his place very embarrassingly in public. He grabbed him by the hair, and he slammed his head against a wall. Cassander hated Alexander. He hated his overrated family. He hated his own father for ruining his chances of becoming one of the great men of the age, holding him back. And now his dad was punishing him from the grave for not measuring up, even though you might say it was his fault Cassander hadn't reached his potential, and he was determined to prove them all wrong. Cassander starts secretly fomenting rebellion in the various cities under Polyprochon's control in Greece, including in Athens. That's a story better left to other Plutarch biographies like The Life of Phocian, the Athenian commander. But with all this seditious activity, Cassander was hoping to find a way to grab the regency from Polyprochon. Polyprochon figures this all out and confronts him. And Cassander flees to Asia to Antigonus the One-Eyed, where Antigonus offers him protection. Polyprochon rightly takes this as tantamount to declaring war. And that's how it all started back up again. Eumenes must have marveled at what a fool old Antipater was. He failed to follow out the full implications of his heedless war with Perdiccas. If you're going to undermine the legitimate authority of the Regency, at least put the strongest and most ambitious man firmly in place. That was Antigonus. Give him full authority. But under the current arrangement, it was inevitable that someone would play Antigonus and Polyprochon against each other. And soon things escalated. As Eumenes was minding his own business in Cappadocia, rebuilding his security forces, trying to raise his fledgling family and rebuild his life, letters bearing the royal seal arrived at his court from Olympias herself. She had come out of retirement in Epirus to support Polyprochon in his war effort against the new enemies of the throne, the enemies of Alexander IV. She needed his help. Was it not Eumenes himself who had warned her to be on guard against Antigonus the One-Eyed? 
Wasn't Eumenes the one that was so convinced Antigonus would never be satisfied with anything less than the whole? That the son of Alexander the Great, his legacy, would never be safe with such a man reigning supreme? Antigonus had ambitious sons too. And Cassander was, as they all knew, a monster. If Cassander and Antigonus won this new war, hope was lost. She wanted Eumenes to come himself to Macedonia and take Alexander's son and raise him as his own. If he didn't like that, then let him at least be a man and take command of the royal army of Macedonia in the name of the kings. Letters had already been sent to the officials in charge of the royal treasuries in Cilicia and other cities, and to the captains of the legendary Silver Shield Phalanx, as well as other royal garrisons throughout Asia. Letters specifying Eumenes as the new royal commander and Antigonus as an enemy of the state. Would he accept? Well, good thing he hadn't sworn that first version of the oath Antigonus sent. How could he not accept? He set out immediately. He declined to take the baby. That would be a nuclear option. And anyway, there was no time. He knew Antigonus was probably already headed his way to prevent him from assembling the royal army. And ancient observers later marveled at how fickle fortune was. For this man, who was only a short time ago condemned to death by the kings and the armies, was now, in the name of the kings, charged with leading those same soldiers who had condemned him. Eumenes makes his way to Cilicia in southern Turkey, where one of these royal treasuries was, and he's joined there by the legendary unit of Macedonian soldiers called the Silver Shields. Over nearly 40 years of continuous fighting, the Macedonian military machine had developed certain battle tactics tied to specific elite units. There were the famous cavalry charges under Alexander, but the most devastating tactical weapon the infantry possessed was a unit of 3,000 Sarissa spearmen who had individually, over the 40 years of campaigns, emerged as the best of the best. They were called the Silver Shields, after Alexander allowed them to decorate their shields like that as an honor. This elite phalanx was the Macedonians' answer to the sacred band of Thebes, pioneered by Epaminondas and Pelopidas. It was a deep phalanx of 18-foot lances, wielded with the power and dexterity of seasoned professional athletes. They were undefeated. Not only did they have incredible tactical value, but they also symbolized legitimacy and military superiority for whatever general commanded them in battle. But they were proud, and most of them had amassed fortunes. Many of them were not just fathers, but grandfathers who kept their wives and children with them on their nomadic campaigns to enforce the will of the king. They did not take war lightly. When Eumenes left for Cilicia, the second round of war had already commenced in Greece. Antigonus gave Cassander troops and logistical support, and Cassander set about actively undermining Polyperchon's authority in the Greek cities, promising them things like freedom and autonomy if they would fight under his banner. He was making raids on Polyperchon's forces already. Eumenes, by joining this war, instantly became the reason Antigonus couldn't double-team with Cassander against Polyperchon. His plan was to go east immediately. Deep east. Many of the satraps in the Iranian high country, in Susiana, Persia, and further east, they resented Antigonus's blatant power grabs. Antigonus had, still, a much bigger army with him, though. So Eumenes takes his own army with the Silver Shields and other royal forces, and they move from Cilicia, through Phoenicia, through Syria, through northern Iraq, down into Mesopotamia and Babylonia, and Antigonus is on their tail, but he's not too close. At first, the Silver Shields and their commanders are very uncomfortable with this whole thing. They don't like taking orders from this Greek bureaucrat, but... He's now the only one with the authority to open all of those treasuries, keep everybody paid, so they follow him. But on the journey, he has a lot of time to win them over, to work his charm. And he knows he's got a killer card that none of the other bosses can play. It's kind of paradoxical. It's the old, I'm just a foreigner line, because he's a Greek. And as everybody knows, no Greek will ever sit on the throne of Macedonia. 
and so he's able to disarm people's suspicions that he's trying to seize power on his own behalf. He's just a servant of Alexander's family, not in it for himself. Now, let's all do the right thing. So he turns his greatest weakness into his greatest strength, and he does it very well. And the silver shields and many other satraps end up rallying to him. And so as they are on their way, Ptolemy sails up from Egypt, and he tries to bribe the silver shields and convince them to abandon Eumenes. You sentenced this guy to death just a little while ago. They tell him to get lost. Antigonus writes letters to the other satraps, sends emissaries, sends bribes. Buzz off, they say. When they get to Babylonia, Seleucus, who's still satrap of Babylon, he comes up and tries to convince the others to abandon Eumenes for the same reasons. You know, Eumenes is a convict. He's a dead man walking. They say, scram. And they end up defeating Seleucus in a series of skirmishes in the hinterlands of Babylon, with the main weapons being the waters of the Tigris. The commanders dig canals in the Tigris River to try to flood each other out, and they defend themselves with dikes. It's kind of a crazy story. Mesopotamia is, by the way, mostly low-lying river plains, after all. And because of his campaign here outside Babylon, Eumenes is briefly mentioned in the Great Babylonian Chronicle, which was started by the ancient kings of Babylon and continued through the Hellenistic period. It's written in cuneiform on clay tablets that are preserved now in the British Museum. So that's one of these great moments in ancient history where sources from two totally different cultures and languages record their own version of events, of the same events, and they both survive. But Eumenes can't get bogged down in Babylonia. He avoids the city itself. He needs to keep moving to unite his forces with the eastern satraps. And now they make their way to the royal city of Susa in the low-lying plains of southwestern Iran, near the confluence of the Tigris and Euphrates, where they flow into the Persian Gulf. And at Susa, and this was a place that was once the old capital city of Cyrus the Great, there they rendezvous with a coalition of eastern satraps. And there's a lot of tension there. Huge egos. Nobody wants to take orders. Lots of mob bosses, but no godfather. And the various men have their claims. One of the satraps present at Susa is Pucestus, a name that doesn't sound quite so funny in Greek. And Pucestus is the satrap of southern Persia. He's a guy who once personally saved Alexander in a siege in India. He threw his body between the king and the enemies. So he's a big deal. He's got the biggest army. But, you know, of course, Susa is technically the turf, actually, of a guy named Antigenes. He's one of the Silver Shield commanders, but he's also officially the satrap of Susa and its large territory. And then, well, there's Eudamus, who's the Greek ruler of the Punjab, the northern Indus Valley. He's the elephant master from the Far East. And he's got 120 war elephants with their specialist Indian elephant riders, too. And so on and so on. And there are other satraps with other claims. And they aren't really sure about Eumenes. He's royal general and all, sure, but we're pretty far from Macedonia. And as these former barons, now satraps, as they're all sizing each other up, nobody wants to settle for anything but the CEO position. But if Eumenes lets any one of them have it, he's not just undermining his own legitimacy and the authority of the kings, the kings who officially appointed him as the royal general and put him in charge of operations, He's also opening the whole group up to more factional infighting due to resentments, because they all consider no man better than themselves. So he comes up with a scheme. He gathers the bosses together, and he tells them that Alexander had appeared to him in a dream and showed him a tent arrayed in a royal fashion with a throne sitting in it. And in this dream, he told Eumenes, Alexander, that if the generals held their councils of war and their business in that tent, that Alexander himself would be with them and give his divine aid to every plan or action they undertook. And kind of amazingly, they agree to it. And they have this tent built and they meet in it. And the genius of the dead Alexander becomes the symbolic commander of the army. Every time they want to discuss important matters, they walk in the tent, burn a little incense to him, make a little prostration, and they sit down in chairs arranged around an empty throne and go about their business. So they aren't taking orders or advice from some Greek ex-bureaucrat who maybe got lucky a few times, but rather they are being guided by Alexander himself. 
In fact, they are of course simply complying with the commands and decrees of the legitimate kings in Macedonia. And they recognize Eumenes' skill and leadership de facto by agreeing to have him command the coalition forces in battle. Perhaps it's not so amazing after all. Eumenes perceived that they actually would be okay arranging things this way. They saw that it was the best way, perhaps, but they also needed a way to save face, and so he gave them one. Meanwhile, Antigonus finally catches up with them. He's a few days' march away from Susa now, practically at the doorstep. Now what? The satraps get into the Alexander tent, and the ghost of Alexander, if you will, advises them to adopt a defensive policy. You might think, why not go in the attack and strike at Antigonus when they were the strongest, with their full forces? Well, by the time Antigonus got there, it was actually the dead of summer in 317 BC, and they happened to be in one of the hottest places in the world. The low valley around Susa was famous in antiquity for being scorchingly hot. Strabo says that in the summertime, lizards in Susa would get incinerated crossing the street in midday, and barley would pop like popcorn if you left it out in the sun. So think Death Valley, but humid, because there are actually a lot of rivers there coming down from the high mountains, the Zagros Range. So the land alone will kill you. And so they decide to fortify the biggest river, the Karun, and Antigonus gets impatient, understandably, and he tries to make it across, and he gets about 10,000 of his best troops over, but Eumenes gets word and catches them with his cavalry before they can consolidate, and he scatters or kills most of them, and they capture about 4,000. It's a huge disaster for Antigonus. Point goes to Eumenes. Antigonus retreats north to Ekbatana, modern Hamadan, deep in northwestern Iran, the old capital city of the Median Empire before Cyrus the Great conquered it. And Eumenes sees the opportunity now to go around Antigonus, to go back to Europe, to relieve Polyperchon and rejoin with Olympias, and he proposes this. But the eastern satraps refuse. They would leave their territory wide open to Antigonus to ravage and plunder it. And Eumenes is faced with another difficult choice. Detach a small force to go join up with the kings in Macedonia and help Polyperchon and Olympias beat Cassander and leave the eastern satraps to their own devices, or try to defeat Antigonus with them in Persia. But if he left, he saw that it was likely that Antigonus would either defeat these quarrelsome and easily divided men on the battlefield, or cajole and convince them to join his own side. And so he concedes, and the royal coalition goes south to Persepolis, and they spend the winter there. And meanwhile, they get news from the Western Front that the navy of Antigonus and Cassander has defeated Polyperchon's navy in a great sea battle around the Hellespont. Antigonus now controls the Aegean. He also controls Asia Minor, since Eumenes had to abandon it. The enemies now control the lines of communication between Eumenes and Macedonia. They're on their own now, and they won't be hearing from Polyperchon and Olympias. That was a great blow to the coalition strategically, but it also threatened Eumenes' position as general, and tensions started to build again. The satraps now don't even know whether the kings are alive or not. They aren't so motivated to comply with the royal decrees. They're in Persepolis now, an area where the official satrap is Pucestus, who was, again, Alexander's bodyguard that once saved his life in the battle in India. And it's the capital city there, Persepolis, a grand city. And there was a great palace and large statues and stone reliefs of the Persian kings stood there. Many of them are still standing today. And their host, Pucestus, pulls a power move. He throws a massive public feast to celebrate their sort of minor and inconclusive recent victory and the inauguration of this new dream team of Eastern satraps and uh, former royal secretaries. And it's a huge outdoor party for the army and its leaders, tables arranged in giant concentric circles. There's a tent temple erected right there at the feast with incense burning for Philip and Alexander, the dead kings. 
wafting incense toward the festivities. And the message that Pucestus is sending is pretty clear. Isn't this a feast worthy of kings? And a man who can throw a feast like this, well, isn't he worthy of being the top boss? And Eumenes is starting to suspect that Pucestus and the other satraps are looking for a way to get him out of the picture. So he takes another trick out of his Odysseus bag. He approaches several of these bosses individually to loan him a lot of money. Plutarch says 400 talents, so about 10 tons or so of silver. And then he spends it on this and that, and he pays his soldiers some, and he gets rid of it all very quickly. And before these guys can compare notes and realize what's happened, he's assembled a core group of satraps who know that if Eumenes dies, there's no way they are ever going to get their money back. So they want to keep him alive, and they're kind of stuck with him. Is it not sometimes, in fact, the debtor who rules the creditor? Well, then they get word as winter is coming on, that, surprisingly, Antigonus has replenished himself already, and he's on the march again, heading right for them. This was uncommon in those days to fight in the winter, but Eumenes has no choice but to go out and meet him, and they set off deep into the mountainous regions of west-central Iran. This area is high deserts, mountains, the occasional river, and some fertile valleys, but mostly it's forbidding territory, you could picture Arizona, southern Utah, if you're familiar with those places, like from an old western movie. But instead of mounted bands of cowboys and Indians, the generals are each leading around fighting forces of maybe 35,000 men, which amounts to about 70 to 100,000 people on each side. Pack animals, war horses, war elephants, and all of the attendants of camp and so on. And war elephants, by the way, can process about 200 pounds or 90 kilos of food per day. So you can imagine the logistical challenges in that kind of region. And there are these great dry salt lakes that they have to cross. Salt and dust is getting on everything, and it's bitter cold at night. And the armies finally meet south of Isfahan in a region back then called Paraitakini. And this was going to be the showdown that everyone had been waiting for. It was going to be the largest pitched battle anyone had fought since Alexander's massive invasion of India. Hieronymus of Cardia, one of Eumenes' countrymen fighting on his side, later became a historian. He described the scene for later generations. Both sides had assembled great diverse coalitions, mercenaries, national cohorts, Medians, Persians, Bactrians, Thracians, Greeks of all sorts, Macedonians. Antigonus's young son, Demetrius, 20 years old, was leading the cavalry, his first great battle, like a young Alexander at Chironea. And Eumenes can see the warlord satrap of Media, Pathon, across the field. Pathon was the reason that Eumenes had such an easy time convincing the eastern satraps to join his side. He's a local guy, and they really hate him. The trumpets sound, the lines engage, it's a hard-fought battle. Pathon leads a cavalry charge, Eumenes repulses it. The elephants on Eumenes' side are triumphant. But the real decisive factor in this battle, though, is the silver shields. They devastate the enemy phalanx cut through them like butter. The enemy lines melt. But it's not a rout, and they don't chase them. And the royalist coalition, Eumenes' coalition, wins a tactical victory, but it's not a decisive victory. Because the combat actually lasts until late in the evening, and after the fighting stops, the armies stay on the field. It's a clear night, it's a full moon, and they keep shuffling and jostling, looking across the plain at each other, waiting for the right opportunity to start the fight again. Like two boxers who've beaten each other up, both exhausted. And one guy is doing okay, and the other guy looks like a hamburger. But both are still standing. And then the guy in better shape says, Come on, fight's over. Obviously I won. And the other guy, tottering there, he says, Come on, fight me like a man. And so the silver shields, at some point in the night, they say, you know, we're too old for this. Nothing's going to happen. Clearly we won. We're going to bed. And Eumenes tries to stop them. 
who's leading this army after all. But after their amazing decisive performance on the battlefield and considering his unstable position as leader, he can't really risk disciplining them and he's forced to concede to their wishes and allow them to lead a return to their camp. But Antigonus stays on the field overnight. He buries all his dead and they're off by morning. And he claims victory. He clearly knew it wasn't worth risking another fight and implicitly acknowledged a defeat by retreating back north. But he wanted that moral victory to keep his troops motivated because obviously this war was not over. Now Eumenes stays in the area in a fertile valley nearby. He splits up his army into winter quarters, each camp several days march apart. But then in the middle of the winter, Antigonus decides to lead a sneak attack to try to catch Eumenes off guard. And he takes a daring route through a vast, salt-flat desert in the dead of winter, cutting a 25-day journey down to nine. But Eumenes finds out about it in time, and he's ready when Antigonus arrives. And the armies are getting ready for another pitched battle, a lot like the one that they just fought at Paraitakini. But Eumenes gets a secret report from Eudamus, the elephant master. And this, by the way, one of the guys that he owed a lot of money, so you can decide what his motives were. And he reveals to Eumenes that the other satraps are finally fed up with following him, and they are even maybe a bit jealous of his success in the earlier battle. And so, they're conspiring to get rid of him. And the plan is to use him for the next battle, in which they fully expect to defeat Antigonus, and then do away with him afterward. Eumenes thanks him, goes to his tent, and breaks the news to his friends and advisors, like Hieronymus. And he says to them, this whole damn campaign is a parade of wild beasts. He looks around, considers his options. Should he throw the fight? Let these unruly satraps to the mercy of Antigonus? Flee back to his province of Cappadocia? Maybe he could find a way to live in peaceful obscurity. But what would Achilles have done? What would Alexander himself have done? Sure, the boy king could be dead by now, for all you many's knows. They haven't had word from Macedonia in months. But he could be alive, too. And you many's of Cardia, this Greek secretary from nowhere, who loved that boy's father and his grandfather. This Greek might be his only hope. And you many's decides to face his fate and go out fighting. He makes his will and tears up all of his papers to protect his friends who might be implicated in various schemes and secrets. There were many. And the armies line up against each other in a place called Gabienae. And the armies are preparing for a pitched battle like before. But this time, they're not in a field, but on one of those dry Salt Lake flats. And the battle lines are starting off about five miles from each other before the charge. Eumenes is the one to make the first move. He orders his cavalry forward. Antigonus's cavalry overpowers them. Or rather, Bucestus, who was leading Eumenes' cavalry on that end, he throws the fight. And some historians think it was betrayal. Others call it cowardice. Eumenes can't read his mind, but either way it looks despicable. But this is a big battle, and that doesn't end it. And the Silver Shields, the cutting edge of the Royal Coalition, they're devastating once again. They demolish the opposing infantry. Now that section of the battle looks like a victory for Eumenes. And actually, things were looking pretty bad for Antigonus. But he sees an opportunity. Plutarch says, But Antigonus was a man who kept cool in the presence of danger. And he was aided by the ground, for the plain where they fought was vast, and its soil was neither deep nor trodden hard, but sandy, and full of a dry and saline substance, which, loosened up by the trampling of so many horses and men, issued forth in a dust-like lime, and this made the air all white and obscured the vision. A great salty dust cloud is kicked up, and Antigonus, under cover of this cloud, secretly sends a cavalry unit at top speed around the back of the Royal Coalition Army toward Eumenes' baggage train, which was several miles away. 
And the ancient sources agree here that Eumenes actually won a tactical victory in the battle. And the armies retreat to their camps. Eumenes and his commanders begin to talk about what to do next. He wants to finish Antigonus off the next day. But suddenly, they receive a report that the baggage train was captured by Antigonus's forces. And in that baggage train was a lot of food and tools and gold and plunder, but also it contained the single most important game piece that anybody could hold in this war. And Antigonus knew it. And he took a play right out of Sun Tzu's Art of War. First seize something that they love, for then they will listen to you. It was the wives and children of the Silver Shields. And during the night and the chaos, the Silver Shields, not their commanders in fact, but leading members of the fighting force, on their own initiative, they enter into secret negotiations with Antigonus. And here's Plutarch. And when Antigonus promised not only to give their belongings back to the Silver Shields, but also to treat them kindly in other ways, provided they would deliver up Eumenes to him, the Silver Shields formed a dire design to put the man alive into the hands of his enemies. So to begin with, they drew near him without awakening his suspicions and subtly assembled a guard around him, some making complaints about their baggage, others bidding him to be of good courage since he was victorious, and others still denouncing the other commanders. And then suddenly they fell upon him, snatched his sword away from him, and tied his hands fast with a belt. Antigonus then sends ten elephants and some elite Persian and Median spearmen as an escort to keep off any of the coalition army that might disagree with this unilateral action by the silver shields. Eumenes calls out to his troops to blame them for their deceit, but it's no use. After losing their leader, and effectively their strongest fighting contingent, the Silver Shields, the rest of the army quickly concedes and goes over to Antigonus. And now Antigonus keeps Eumenes at a distance. He has him guarded like a lion. And you get the sense here that he genuinely liked Eumenes and regarded him as an equal. But he doesn't want to see him. He doesn't want his emotions to cloud his judgment about what to do. Antigonus has some of the other eastern satraps who had opposed him executed, but he keeps Eumenes alive. He's deliberating about what to do. He relaxes Eumenes' guard so that friends can visit him. He lets him take a bath. Demetrius, his son who's been fighting in these battles, begs him to spare Eumenes. Nearchus, Eumenes' old friend, who had sailed the Indian Ocean on a great exploratory mission for Alexander. He's there in Antigonus's camp, too. He begs him to spare Eumenes. But the other satraps in Antigonus's forces are all demanding Eumenes be executed. I suppose they reminded him of how the army had just recently sentenced him to death for making war on Craterus and Antipater, for taking the side of the tyrant, so to speak, Perdiccas, who wanted to make himself king. I suppose that the more cynical among them pointed out that Eumenes was the most talented and legitimate defender of the royal monarchy of Alexander. Antigonus wanted to keep the kings as puppets, of course, as long as they were useful. But Eumenes was the only man standing who would fight to the death to ensure Alexander IV made it into manhood and became the rightful king. He was the only man who still believed in this wild dream of Olympias, that the empire of Alexander the Great really could hold together in his name, that the diverse cultures of East and West and North and South could be united in one kingdom under the great vision of a divine ruler. The mere existence of such a man like Eumenes made people think possible an idea that Antigonus wanted to stamp out. Antigonus, you're a practical man. Finish the job. And so he did. He had Eumenes starved for a few days to weaken him, and then he sent someone in to do the deed. Antigonus did allow the man's friends to cremate him ceremonially 
and to send his ashes in a silver urn to his Persian wife and children who were back in Cappadocia waiting for news. Word soon got to Macedonia too, where Olympias had been taking a lead role in operations against Cassander, but he had her under siege by then. After the news arrived of the fall of Eumenes, she surrendered. Cassander broke his oath to her and had Olympias executed. With Eumenes then perished hope for a unified kingdom. Instead of an empire ruled by heirs, these lands became a battleground fought over by the successors, the Diadochoi. And the wars and intrigues and anarchy that Eumenes foresaw continued for an entire generation. But that is a story for another day, for another life. We hope you enjoyed the life of Eumenes of Cardia. Stay tuned for the epilogue and for the comparison episode in which we'll put Eumenes alongside Sertorius and analyze their lives and legacies. If you did enjoy this, please tell someone about it and help us to grow this project. You can visit our website at ancientlifecoach.com and sign up there for our once a week ancient philosophical emails. Until next week, this is Alex Petkus. Alex Petkus